Hello and welcome to Thought Provoking Tech. I'm Zach and in today's episode of the Cloud Gaming Report, we have quite a bit of news, including an app update for Parsec, which adds a dark mode in addition to a party finder, which is pretty cool. I'll get to that later. We have the GeForce Now uh, games that have been added to the officially supported list. And there is quite a bit of shadow news, in addition, including a CPU upgrade announcement, which is pretty exciting. So we'll get to all that here shortly. So without further delay, let's go ahead and jump right to it. So the first topic I'm going to be talking about is the GeForce Now games that have been added to the officially supported list. These are Battalion 1944, The Binding of Isaac Rebirth, Cross Out, Deceit, Desolate, Far Cry 4, You Play for Russia, which I'm assuming is a Russian edition of the game, but I'm not exactly sure, and Golf with Your Friends. In addition, on 4.18, they added a couple of additional games, which are Next Day Survival and SCP Secret Laboratory. So quite a few games have been added to the officially supported list and uh, G for GeForce Now in the past week. So hopefully one of those games is something that interests you if you are on the GeForce Now platform. Moving on to Shadow News, we, there was a live show by Shadow which was transcribed uh, or translated by Del Delirium and transcribed by AA. So there's quite a bit of news here and I will link this full transcription in the description below if you are interested in reading the full uh, transcription. But I have taken out some of the more important announcements and news, uh, at least from my perspective, and I'm going to talk about those and kind of uh, add some of my own commentary to those uh, news and, and slash announcements. So there is a big CPU upgrade, which is the big news for Shadow this week. Uh, and this is pretty major. Uh, right now, for those of us in the US, we have the Xeon E5 2620 processors. I don't know if the European data centers have the exact same CPU, um, so there might be a slight difference there. I do know there are some slight differences in the hardware between the European and the US data center. Uh, such as in the European data center, they run the GTX 1080s over here in the US. We are running the NVIDIA Quadro P5000s, which are very similar GPUs. One of them is just um, more expensive. The P5000 is more expensive and is designed for workstation, whereas the GTX 1080s are the consumer variant of the GPUs. But in terms of the CPUs, uh, we are run going from an 8 core 16 thread CPU with a base clock frequency of 2.1 gigahertz and a max turbo frequency of 3.0 gigahertz to a Xeon E5-2667 processor that has the same number of cores and threads at 8 cores and 16 threads but the base clock frequency is seeing a massive increase to 3.2 gigahertz and the max turbo frequency is at 3.6 gigahertz. In fact, if you look closely, the base clock frequency for the new processor is actually higher than the turbo frequency of the previous CPU with a base, base clock frequency of 3.2 versus the previous max turbo frequency of 3.0 gigahertz. This is about a 150% roughly uh, cal rough calculation in my mind uh, increase to the base clock frequency which should translate to very impressive improvements in the games. Uh, this will be in, in games where the CPU is actually holding back the GPU. And a lot of games are working to being able to run on multiple threads and multiple cores better, but there are still games that aren't as well optimized and especially older games uh, are, aren't optimized simply because having tons of threads and tons of cores weren't as popular you know, several years ago. So on the news, that's a pretty big uh, increase. Uh, it's just looking at the price of the processors themselves. We're going from like a $400 processor to like a $2,000 processor, which is a pretty massive upgrade. And I think it shows that Shadow has the commitment to the cloud gaming community um, and spending that much on your hardware definitely shows that they're committed to the game. So that's very cool. I'm very interested in seeing what kind of performance upgrades these CPUs actually translate to. Uh, and a couple other observations I have about the CPU upgrade is the difference between the max turbo frequency is much smaller than the difference uh, in the previous generation. Uh, it's actually about half, a little less than half, or right, right, yeah, right around a half or close to about half of the difference between your max turbo frequency and your base clock frequency, which means if you're in a game and the CPU has to throttle back, you won't notice as big as a decrease in your 
FPS if the CPU is the limiting factor. So if your CPU does have the throttle, the difference between the base clock frequency and the turbo frequency is much smaller with the new CPU as it was in the previous CPU. So the difference of performance if the CPU does have the throttle should be much less for us, the end user. Uh, so that's pretty much it on the CPU news. There isn't a timeline set up for this. They have ordered the CPUs, uh, but the shadow team doesn't install them. They have the people that run their data centers. Uh, those guys will be in charge of installing the CPUs. So there isn't a firm timeline simply because they don't have full control over the entire process, but the CPUs have been ordered at this point in time. Also, another important thing to note is that each user will stay at the same number of cores and threads that the CPUs themselves have the same number of cores and threads. So everybody will get four cores and eight threads. Uh, with the new CPU, the same as they had previously on the previous CPU. So there will be two users on each CPU, uh, but we'll have a much higher base clock frequency and a higher turbo clock frequency in addition. Uh, so no timeline currently on these. Uh, it's possible that as the, the admins running the data center start to upgrade, so some people might see the new CPU processor faster. I'm sure there's not going to just be a you know snap of the finger upgrade. I'm sure it's going to be take a couple of machines down, upgrade those, and then put those back online type deal uh, for this entire process. So uh, one final observation about the CPUs, they are from the same generation. Uh, they're both from the Q1 2016, so they're the same generation. So the comparisons between the base and clock frequency should be pretty equivalent because you're not gonna be talking about a generation increase on top of the, you know, the base clock frequency increase too. Uh, so I'm excited to see that and excited to test it. Also keep your eye out. I will probably be doing some preliminary work right now with the, the previous generation CPU uh, and getting some FPS results for a, a, a variety of games, some RTS games possibly, because certain types of games are more CPU bound. Uh, RTS games are, and strategy games in general are generally uh, more CPU bound. Uh, and then certain games are less well optimized in addition to just needing a lot of CPU resources in general. Uh, so I'll be doing a couple FPS results with the previous CPU, and I will be doing the same test with the new CPU to do a direct comparison of previous to past. So keep an eye out for that video sometime in the future once we get the upgrade. Of course, I won't be able to get that video out before we have the upgrade and I have time to uh, do the comparisons and uh, run my analysis and everything like that. So. That's pretty much it on the CPU news. It's a very exciting upgrade, and I'm excited to see when exactly we, uh, we'll actually get to play around with the new CPUs. Uh, the storage performance upgrades, this has been an ongoing topic within Shadow. Uh, these have been going well. A lot of people have been moved over to the new storage. Uh, but on that note, the storage enhancements do mean additional upgrades for in the future. For example, this will allow us to upgrade our base storage from the base allotment we have now to 500 or one terabyte in the future uh, there's no prices announced yet and any timeline again once uh, once again there's no timeline for this uh, upgrade but in the future we will be able to upgrade our storage to 500 or possibly even a terabyte of storage uh, so if you have a lot of games you want to keep installed even though the download speeds are very fast on the shadow machine it doesn't take a long time to download games but if you just want to keep a whole bunch of games installed because you've you you know transition between several games quite frequently uh, that'll allow you to do that or if you plan on using the shadow machine uh, for business purposes and you have a lot of software that you like to keep installed like if you have the adobe suite all that software takes up quite a bit of space and i also have like the auto a lot of autodesk software so combining both of those packages of software from two different providers ends up taking about 300 gigabytes of space which is quite a bit and having the option to upgrade your storage um, allotment is going to be beneficial in the future but once again there's no timeline on that but just news in general on the storage side their linux app the linux app is still being developed uh it's being developed by a single person uh so development is slow slow they just wanted to reassure people that the linux app is still on its way and it is being developed and a cool little snippet from the transcription i saw uh that there's twenty five thousand customers in europe so even in its early stages, cloud gaming has a lot of users. And this is particularly interesting with Shadow Symphony because it does have a pretty big barrier to entry. Uh, and the fact that it is one of the more expensive cloud gaming options out there, 
But in, in the long run, it could be much cheaper simply because you're paying a single monthly fee and you're not paying on an hourly basis. So if you are a heavy gamer or a heavy user, it could be much cheaper for you in the long run. But that big barrier to entry of having to pay you know, $40 a month just to trial it out is pretty big. And the fact that they do have 25,000 customers in Europe that definitely shows that cloud gaming does have a pretty big base. And right now, and in terms of the total gamer market, that's still really small, but it is showing that there are a lot of people interested in cloud gaming and already starting to use utilize cloud gaming. And one final note from this transcription that I wanted to point out is that cryptocurrency mining will get your account closed. Uh, so I just wanted to warn people in case you don't read this full transcription, uh, if you do attempt to mine cryptocurrency, that will get your account um, closed. And I just wanted to mine that, or <laughs> I just wanted to warn you in case you were possibly thinking of utilizing these GPUs for cryptocurrency mining. All right, so the final topic for today's video is going to be the new Parsec update. As you can see here, I'm running the latest version of Parsec and have the dark mode enabled. The dark mode is an awesome UI enhancement, but the star of the latest update is the party finder. So the party finder is kind of the culmination of all the work that Parsec has been putting towards co-play functionality within the Parsec app. So with co-play previously, you could have people on your friends list that were allowed to join a game if you were hosting, or if they were hosting, they would show up on your computer list as a computer that you can connect to and co-play via. This is an amazing feature that worked great for games that support cooperative or split screen play. But for example, what if you only had two friends that wanted to play a certain split screen game and you really wanted that fourth person to join up? Well, that's where the party finder is really cool. You can now go to the party finder, create a party, your two friends that are already wanting to play the game could come join that party and you could try to find a fourth person also wanting to play that same game. So I'm gonna walk through the create a party functionality real quick. So you can see here, you can create a title and a public description. These are things that people are gonna see before they even join your party. So you can say, Come play, you know, Divinity Original Sin 2, which is an example of a game that me and a couple friends have been playing. So you can say, come up with a snazzy little title and then talk about a public description saying like, we've been playing Divinity Original Sin 2. Uh, we're so far in the game. Come join us if you want to play in our campaign. So this is a cool functionality to have to fit out your cooperative or split screen game with someone else that is also interested, but it might be a person that you've never connected with. And this might actual, actually allow you to add more people to your friends list as you meet people that and you have a great experience with them, you can add them to the friends list, which will allow you to better fit out, fill out your parties in the future uh, for games that you wanna play with either via, via co-play or, or cooperative play or split screen. You can also have a private description, which is only stuff people can see after you join your party. You can dictate how many players the party is for, anywhere from two to four. I do wonder if they're gonna increase that in the future uh, because there are games that do a lot more than four players via cooperative play. Uh, so I don't know if they might increase that in the future. And you can also choose your location. So this is the location of your physical computer. So if you're located like I am in the center of the US, you're kind of right on the border of two different options. Uh, but for example, if I was going to host my paper space computer, that is in the New York data center, so I could choose the Eastern North America. And a very cool functionality is you have the approved apps that you can choose to only allow people control to that app. So for example, I don't have a game running, but I'm just gonna choose OBS. So if I choose OBS as the approved app, what I can do here is what people that join my party will only be able to interact with OBS and not the other applications running on my, my computer, which is a great feature, to, if, especially if you're having playing with people that you don't necessarily know uh, well, and this is the first time you've ever played with them. So going back to the party finder, you can also join parties, and that's where that filter comes in play that we just saw earlier about the location. So me being in the center of the US, I could choose both the Eastern and Western North America and have a great experience because I won't be physically too far from either one of those uh, computers because I'm pretty much right down the center of both options. But as you can see here, there aren't any parties right now. That's because this is a like closed beta and you do have to request access to it now. I'm assuming once the feature is fully rolled out, that will be much easier to, to find parties. And it's also earlier on a Saturday morning, which is kind of a lower point in uh, you know, gaming, people playing games right now. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, leave this video a big like also if you liked it and found this video useful. And also, if you're not already an existing subscriber, make sure to smash that subscribe button. And once again, guys, thanks for watching. Zach out.